Okay, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Jerome, for the uh, presentation. Uh, I had one, and, and this is about the last uh, presentation, but it is something that's actually uh, something we, we, we are emphasizing quite a lot. I mean, you presented numbers for growth, for inequality, and for poverty. You demonstrated growth has gone up significantly. Inequality basically did not move. And then you say poverty went down very considerably. Uh, up, sorry, up, of course. Um, now, that begs a question. That's impossible. You cannot have growth up, inequality unchanged, and then poverty substantially worsened. So, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just making this point because this is one of the things that for all of the gap country studies is exactly something that we will, before these things are, are put out there, we will be vetting that very, very clearly and we will be pushing the country study authors uh, very much until we at least have reasonable explanations for this triangle. So, so this was my observation. Thanks. study and uh, essentially two points. The, uh, the first one uh, is that the uh, poverty estimates come from the uh, National Bureau of Statistics but you don't say anything about the methodology that was used. Was it the same poverty line deflated by cost of uh, living uh, uh, indices that or did the National Bureau of Statistics uh, come up with different poverty lines, in which case these comparisons are not very meaningful. So I think it's very important to look at the underlying methodology before you uh, uh, make any kind of statement about uh, poverty going up or down. And this goes back to uh, Finn's uh, point. This may account for the inconsistency. Now, on the uh, methodology that you use, um, I, I really, you know, even though I think uh, multidimensional poverty indicators are important, uh, I have some, some real questions about uh, just using the number of deprivations as an indicator of the extent of poverty. Uh, you say nothing about the possibility of compensation. It's quite possible that the household is deprived in one or two dimension, but may be significantly above the threshold in another dimension, so that there is a possibility, in theory, for this household to compensate. If uh, income lies there above the property uh, uh, threshold, but uh, uh, maybe uh, food consumption wise below it, they could use some of that income to get more food. So, as long as, as we don't know anything about the actual level uh, of deprivation, as well as any possible surplus uh, in some of the dimensions, uh, I think it's a very arbitrary uh, way of uh, measuring. Uh, multi-dimensional poverty. And, and I know that many people do it, and, and so I'm not attacking you personally, but I, I think it's professional to be much more careful before it uses these uh, uh, indicators. I'll take one more, uh, Andy, in the back there, and then we'll uh, let him respond to and more questions. To your, to your right, right behind you. Okay, um, mine is really a follow-up on Eric's first point. Um, we know that some of these Nigerian surveys are not comparable. The surveys before 1996 are just not comparable with the later surveys. They're a very different methodology. Uh, if surveys are comparable, the only ones that I think legitimately are are the ones after 1996. Um, the second point is about the figures for 2004. The World Bank has come out with a very revised figure for poverty in 2004 in World Development Indicators, 
which is actually slightly, which is actually 64 or something like that. They've revised the figure substantially. Now, I have no idea where this comes from or what the basis of, of, of it is, but it sounds like these numbers are contested, or at least under discussion. And it would be good to, it would be good to have some discussion of this, even if the main part of your focus is on the multidimensional. Okay, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much. It does appear that the very difficult questions were reserved for me. Well, on a more serious note, these are very germane and uh, good questions. Uh, poverty estimates, uh, what the National Bureau does, they normally present, they do a consistent survey, then they have a methodology whereby they present four different types, four different poverty estimates. So I will check again and make sure we report actually on what they did. Luckily, they have somebody who is very amenable now. Uh, so the fact that data in Nigeria is very problematic. So we'll carefully report what they've done. I mean, because uh, just uh, last week, even the World Bank came back with some revision of some of the 2010 uh, results, which I'll take a look at. Uh, looking at the uh, deprivation, I mean, what we just reported here are two extremes. I mean, you have, uh, I mean, suppose we have five, then two, which means you have a uh, five to power two, 32 different outcomes which you can have. You can have a zero, 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 or one, 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 just the two extremes. But in the paper, we've carefully reported the different outcomes. You can have a situation where by household, I mean, they're very good in one or something. Oh, well, we that is, uh, we are mindful of the comments which you made, but I do agree. But it's good, but it goes for the first time. I mean, it seems like the discussion in Nigeria has been taken away from oil, which is why it's very important for you to actually see what is uh, happening. Um, Andy, I do agree with you. I know you are very familiar with uh, Nigeria. But looking at all, most of the indicators, I mean, in terms of what is directly comparable, we look at all of them. The best we could get was just uh, 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 2004 stroke uh, 2010. Both in terms of methodology and uh, the definition of these uh, various uh, indicators, that was the closest that we could get. But I think uh, I do agree that we will discuss far before some of these things as we take the project forward. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do we have other questions uh, for any of the panelists? I guess I some hands. Are there. Thanks, I enjoyed all the presentations very much. I've got a naive question for Michael, which is about um, structural, your ideas around structural transformation in Burkina Faso. And we talked a little bit about agricultural intensification, but do you think that urbanization or industrialization within the context of Burkina Faso makes sense? I won't say Malthus again. I, I look at your paper. You, you don't actually mention it, so I, 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 I forget about it. But the important point is, is policy. The question I want to ask uh, to, to all the panelists is, is, is whether there's any way in which you can start incorporating any, any uh, indices or indicators of, of, of policy into this, uh, this analysis. If you, this is still descriptive, you know, the north grows less than the south. There's, there's still very little on the Y, right? And then if I and then if you look at, at the indicators that do exist, is there anything on like I said, I was you mentioned Malthus, I was looking at the uh, uh indicators of governance. Actually there are indicators there and, and I just would be so happy you could see this that it could kind of relate to your question again. How can you answer those questions with this kind of thing? Yeah. So thanks for the question. Uh, I so I definitely think it makes sense, and I think there are also some possibilities. I mean, probably the most obvious one is uh, agro-industry. I think there's definitely a scope for that, and that would be possible. That would be possible in the medium term. And there's also a huge potential for interregional trade. You know, the trade between, say, West African countries is in fact um, the, the 
there's quite little of that, and that could definitely be expanded. So uh, that would be a first step, and that I think with a little bit of political action that would be easy to implement. But then, of course, what could be under other industries? I mean, if you think of a continuous upgrade, say maybe of the type we have seen in, in many of the cells, East Asian countries, what well, that could then be, that's a more difficult question. And of course, many people think about that. What could be, you know, the sectors uh, where Africa could be competitive in the, the medium and long term? You know? So there, it's yeah, a bit harder to give a, a good answer. But agri-industry is definitely the first thing. Um, and now, because I have the mic, I, I want to take uh, just 20 seconds to, to, to answer to Ajahn. Um, so what we mean by the Malthusian um, trap is that we have here, uh, say, uh, equilibrium, where we have high demographic growth and um, where we have more or less an absence of technological progress. And that makes it Malthusian. At the same time, of course, you can leave that trap by increasing productivity through technological progress. Yeah, and that if you look at unified growth theory, that's exactly how you structure the problem. You go from a Malthusian equilibrium to a post-Malthusian and to a modern growth machine. Yeah. So Malthus somehow ignored that this possibility there that of course we do not, but it's a good description of what we have seen over the past, say, 20, 30 years and where we are now. Yeah. So that's maybe. So is there a way you can incorporate it in the analysis? Because it's just, it's just like an well, if you said, uh, I mean, I think I, I provide a lot of explanations for the, the numbers I, I presented. I mean, more specifically, maybe on the governance issue, whether you want to understand what you mean here, example, coming up with an, an indicator of uh, how good or bad governance is in facilitating the shift, or? Perhaps we could have this conversation. I was that I was still uh, Mainly descriptive in its uh, in its favor, but uh, but well, yet I think that the story we provide uh, describes a well a long term uh, Ivorian uh, model uh, that was very uh, well, that was in the past very much praised for for its success uh, that relied on, on the expansion of cash crops uh, whether it is in the southern uh, forest uh, from the from the, the, the the border of, of with Ghana towards the, the, the border of Guinea, and then, so there was a kind of cocoa fraud and an expansion of this uh, uh, cocoa output that relied on, uh, on mainly on the migration of Baule uh, 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 cocoa growers from their region of origin towards uh, the, the border of Guinea. And so it was mainly relying on extensive uh, agriculture, whether you look at and it's also the case in the northern region where here you have an annual crop that, is, uh, that, has many, uh, that differs in many respects in terms of agronomic constraints, but still you had also this, uh, uh, and here compares uh, the extension of cotton production, uh, compares better with uh, the kind of observation uh, that Michael has on, on Burkina Faso because it's also a cotton producing country. And so it was an Ivorian model because through this expansion of uh, the output of cash crops, the state could extract uh, a growing, uh, growing fiscal income, growing fiscal revenue, and invest it on the one hand in education and in, uh, in uh, health services, and on the other hand also on the further development of this cash crop production investment in roads and so and I thought Cote d'Ivoire was very much praised for all the success in terms of investment in infrastructure and the great progresses in education that allowed it to uh, allowed her to catch up with neighboring Ghana with in terms of education. So I think that well so one could now question uh, to the sustainability so perhaps it's a similar question to uh, Michel uh, Swan, uh, but in a completely in a rather different context, the sustainability of such a model when uh, well, the, you no longer have forest available to, uh, to extend, further extend uh, cocoa output when you so know that the soils may a long period, require a long time to recover uh, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is what's... 
but I would be very much interested uh, in getting uh, uh, this this data on local governments you are alluding to. So, so let's let's uh, let's talk. Uh, thank you, Jay. Finn, I think ask a very Jamaican question for you. Can have a high growth rate to worsening poverty. I think this whole brings it to notion the, what we're talking about, the how inclusive the growth process is. Uh, looking at the Nigerian scene, you ask yourself like which sectors are you driving the growth? I mean, oil is an inclusive uh, economy, accounting for just about uh, fifty thousand jobs or less. Or like agriculture, I mean, which account for the bulk and the informal sector. So much, but there's too much hungry. So it's not really contributing to the growth process. The people are getting poorer. But these are some of the political economy issues which we examine as part of this project. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. We've reached the end of uh, the session. Um, please join me in thanking that.